Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening around the world. On behalf of all our colleagues from the SCC Riyadh and Uncetral Vienna, we're delighted to welcome you all to our first in a series of SCCA Uncetral webinars. My name is James McPherson. I'm special counsel of the SCCA and International Dispute Resolution Specialist, and I'm delighted to moderate today's webinar, History, Background, and the Future of the Uncetral Convention. Allow me first to welcome the CEO of the SCCA, uh, Dr. Hamid Nera, who will just be delivering some welcome remarks. Ustad Hamid. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are proud and honored to uh, host all of you today, the first uh, series of webinars with the UNICEF Um uh, We are delighted to have uh, all of you today uh, to speak about the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the, uh, one of the founding signatories of uh, Singapore Convention and the fourth country uh, to uh, ratify the, uh, 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 the convention. Uh, I don't want to speak much about the convention about Saudi Arabia in this regard. Uh, if you allow me just in the coming few seconds, I would just want to highlight um, some efforts has been done by SCCA in mediation. Uh, SCCA, as you know, an independent international ADR center. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, we launched in October 2016, and early 2017, we launched our arbitration rules in addition to our mediation rules. Uh, these two sets of rules has been drafted and developed uh, with the uh, international help with AAA ICDR. Uh, so it is within the international uh, best practices. Uh, we are the only, the first and the only ADR center in Saudi Arabia um, have uh, 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 mediation rules. In addition to that, starting from 2016-17, we started with our international partner, AAA ICDR, uh, to conduct specialized programs in mediation. Uh, and also we are honored. This, all these programs have been conducted with international uh, well-known experts, and we have two of them with us today. Um, more than 200 um, uh, lawyers, uh, practitioners, they participated in these um, advanced program in mediation. So we started the investment in mediation very early, uh, started from 2016. So we are the only, the first and the only ADR center in Saudi to invest in conducting specialized program in mediation in particular, in addition to arbitration and some other areas related to ADR. We are the only, the first and the only center in Saudi. We have a dedicated roster for mediators. We are honored and happy to say that we have a well-diversified uh, arbitration roster in addition to a dedicated roster. Um, so uh, now our, our roster uh, consists of more around 70 uh, mediators, male and female, from more than 16 countries all around the world. And they are in more than 10 specialized industries. So we are the first and the only center in Saudi. We have a dedicated roster for mediators. Uh, we invested in this roster early 2016-17. Uh, uh, and also at the same time, we are honored to sign with the Ministry of Justice um, around two years ago, uh, um, uh, like uh, a pilot project to, to refer cases from the, the commercial court to SCCA and Alhamdulillah today SCCA less than four years old and Alhamdulillah we managed more than 22 mediation cases and the settlement uh, uh, ratio in these cases around 70% which is something very high comparing to the international practice. Um, and some of these cases is, uh, has been settled within only one session uh, in the first session and we are also happy uh, to have some success stories it might be shared in, the, in this seri series. Uh, for example, um, we are proud of our mediators and especially the female mediators. Um, uh, for example, I remember very well 
in the in the International Day for Women at that day by yani, by accident. So we had a female <coughs> judiciators, and it was both parties representative were female, and they settled the dispute within the first session. So we have a lot of good stories, happy stories, sexist stories, and alhamdulillah, I think this is going on in mediation. Um, uh, and also, we were part of the efforts of uh, preparing and uh, recommending Saudi Arabia to join uh, the uh, Singapore Convention. Um, and um, we are still uh, conducting specialized program. And also, uh, one of the big milestones I'm proud of, and we are in SCCA proud of, is the launch of the EMB, the Emergency COVID-19 Emergency Mediation Program. It has been developed within uh, less than seven weeks, and Alhamdulillah, it has been recognized by GAR, one of the top 10 initiatives globally uh, to deal with uh, COVID in terms of ADR. So it's a big achievement for a center in its uh, four years, so to be part of the best 10 initiatives to deal with COVID-19, which is the EMB, I'm sure that uh, today you will hear a little bit some details about EMB. I don't want to take more of your time, uh, I would like to thank again our partners in UNICEFAL. Uh, it's uh, a big achievement and we are proud of this partnership. So I would like to thank them again. And also I would like to thank my team, well-known superstars, mediators today. They are joining us to speak in this first uh, episode of this series of uh, webinars. And also I would like to thank uh, the Minister of Commerce uh, uh, the, uh, for their uh, continuous support and help of SCCA and of of ADR, generally speaking, in Saudi Arabia. I would like to thank personally Mr. Badr al-Haddad, the Deputy Minister, for his personal and institutional uh, continuous support and help of SCCA and um, arbitration, mediation in Saudi Arabia, and also His Excellency, before, before that, His Excellency, the Minister of Commerce, uh, Dr. Majid al Ghassabi, and the whole team in the Minister of Commerce. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for your time to participate with us from all around the world to attend this first uh, uh, episode of uh, Sirius. Uh, thank you again. I would like to, to keep the time for our superstar mediators. I think all of you are eager to listen from them. And also I'm preparing my pen and my, uh, my paper to write down uh, information and uh, uh, new uh, ideas. Uh, so mm -hmm. I would like to leave you with them. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Uh, allow me now to give the floor for some opening remarks from the gentleman referred to, His Excellency, Mr. Badr Abdul Mohsen Al Haddad. Uh, he's the Deputy Minister of Policies and Regulations of the Ministry of Commerce. And importantly, we were very proud when Mr. Bada represented the Kingdom and signed on behalf of the Kingdom the Singapore Convention last August. I welcome Mr. Bada. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for arranging this very important and significant event. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala khatam al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Ataqaddam bi wafir al-shukr wa al-imtinan ila lajnat al-qawaneen al-tijariya bil-umam al-muttahida ala al-juhud wa al-masa'i al-kabira wa al-hathitha fi tertib wa i'dad itifaqiyyat singhafora lil-wasata wa al-fa'aliyat al-dawliya dhat al-silah biha wa kathalika ila al-zumala al-kiram fi al-markaz al-saoudi للتحكيم التجاري على جهودهم المميزة في تطوير الوسائل البديلة لتسوية المنازعات وفق مفاهيم وآليات مؤسسية تستهدف العدالة والشفافية والسرعة عند الحديث عن اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة اتفاقية سنغافورة بشأن اتفاقات التسوية الدولية المنبثقة من الوساطة من منظور حكومة المملكة تولي حكومة المملكة أهمية وحرص وهذا الأمر منطلق كما هو معلوم من أن الوساطة أحد الوسائل المهمة لتسوية المنازعات لقدرتها على التوصل إلى حلول متفق عليها وتحظى بالقبول بين الأطراف وتحافظ على العلاقات التجارية بينهم إلى جانب رعاية وخفض كلفة الوقت والكلفة المالية وقد حرصت حكومة المملكة على التوقيع على الاتفاقية لتكون ضمن أول ثلاث دول عربية وقعت على الاتفاقية بتاريخ 7 أغسطس من عام 2019 بسنغافورة ضمن عدد 46 دولة 
وصدر قرار مجلس الوزراء بتفويض معالي وزير التجارة أو من ينيبه بالتوقيع المملكة عالميا رابع دولة تصادق على الاتفاقية بتاريخ 5 مايو 2020 وهذا يعكس يعكس رؤية القيادة في تعزيز بدائل والوسائل البديلة لتسوية المنازعات وتوفير وتهيئة البيئة التنظيمية والتشريعية الملائمة لها في المجال في الجانب الوطني ودعم التنفيذ لما يصدر عنها من قرارات وأحكام أو تسويات كل ذلك يعكس الجدية الكبيرة لتحقيق العدالة الناجزة وتوسيع خيارات المستثمر الأجنبي والوطني في ظل رؤية المملكة عشرين ثلاثين هذه الاتفاقية تساهم في تعزيز الإطار القانوني للوساطة وما ينتج عنه من تسويات لتحسين البيئة لتسوية المنازعات العابرة للحدود وتشجيع ثقافة الوساطة وخلق بيئة محفزة وجاذبة للاستثمار وتقوية عمل مؤسسات تسوية المنازعات فيما يتعلق أيضا بالوساطة في المملكة من الجانب التشريعي والمؤسسي والتنظيمي أنشئ من قبل المركز السعودي للتحكيم خدمات للوساطة حرص عليها من 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 بداية إنشائه وتوج ذلك أيضا بصدور تنظيمة مؤخرا وما يعني عقد من شراكات دولية لضمان العمل على أفضل وأحدث المعايير الدولية كذلك أطلق المركز مشروع إحالة القضايا بالمحاكم التجارية إلى المركز لتسويتها بآليات الوساطة وكذلك أطلق برنامج استثنائي خاص بجائحة كورونا كوفيد-19 ويقدم خدمة الوساطة عن بعد وما يصدر عنه يعني يحوز صفة سندات تنفيذية وهذا الأمر تم مع بالتنسيق مع مركز المصالحة التابع لوزارة العدل أيضا على الجانب التنظيمي أنشأت المملكة مركز مصالحة تابع لوزارة العدل بقرار من مجلس الوزراء وفعل مؤخرا هذا المركز بشكل كبير ويدعم هذا المركز منظومة المصالحة والوساطة في المملكة والحقيقة أيضا صدور نظام المحاكم التجارية الجديد في أبريل 2020 ولائحة التنفيذية اللي عبر بوضوح عن مفاهيم المصالحة والوساطة وقرر اللجوء إلى الوساطة في المنازعات التجارية قبل نظر الدعاوى في المحاكم التجارية في عدد من المنازعات وبخاصة ما يتعلق بمنازعات الشركاء والمنازعات اللي تقع بين التجار والمنازعات ذات الصلة بالعقود التجارية الحقيقة أن هناك توجه كبير نحو دعم الوسائل البديلة لتسوية المنازعات لمزاياها اللي تتمثل في التراضي والاتفاق والمساحة الأكبر للأطراف لتسوية منازعاتهم مع حفظ العلاقة التجارية الودية و السماح باستمرارها وكذلك الحقيقة جوانب السرعة وجوانب الكلفة المالية وأكرر شكري للزملاء في المركز السعودي للتحكيم التجاري على تنظيم هذه الفعالية وأسأل الله أن تكون نواة لعمل مؤسسي مستدام يعزز مفاهيم الوساطة والمصالحة ويبث ثقة الثقة فيها لدى مجتمع الأعمال وتحقق غاياتها وشكرا جزيلا لكم. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. <clears throat> It's important that he, this message is delivered from the ministry because the ministry, as Dr. Hamid has expressed from the outset, has been so incredibly supportive, as has the Ministry of Justice, among others, in promoting everything from pilot projects and mediation to the convention itself and to just following through with the implementation and moving forward and progressing generally uh, with our partners at UNCITRAL. So we're delighted now to have uh, from UNCITRAL, especially prepared uh, remarks from the UNCITRAL secretary, uh, Dr. Anna joubin Brett, and I'll allow Mr. Usman to roll this comment from Vienna. Good 
morning and greetings from Vienna. It we seem to have satellite difficulty. Um, shall we press on and return to uh, our good friend? Oh, here we are. Good morning and greetings from Vienna. It's a privilege and a pleasure for me on behalf of Ancitral to extend a virtual welcome today. We are delighted by the level of interest in this first year anniversary of the signing of the Singapore Convention on Mediation on the 7th of August 2020. And we're pleased to have you participate and share in our celebration of this momentous occasion. The Singapore Convention on Mediation facilitates international trade and promotes mediation as a credible alternative and an effective method of, of resolving commercial disputes by providing an effective mechanism for the enforcement of international settlement agreements resulting from mediation. With the introduction and continued presence of the, con the Convention to provide certainty and trust in the mediation process, we are hopeful that mediation becomes a useful tool that makes the method of international dispute settlements more effective and more cost, effect, more cost efficient. We are proud to celebrate the success of this convention because it gives us faith in multilateralism and hope in global solutions to the unprecedented challenges we are all faced with because of the COVID-19 pandemic. On the opening of the on the opening day of the Singapore Convention on Mediation just a year ago, 46 states signed the instrument, making it one of the most successful conventions developed by ANSITRAL thus far. Since then, 52 states in total have signed the convention. Singapore first, then Fiji and Qatar have deposited their respective instruments of ratification. And Saudi Arabia joined us on the 5th of May I wish to congratulate Saudi Arabia for its enthusiastic commitment to the Singapore Convention and to mediation, and to this, its goal of strengthening the enforceability of settlement agreements resulting from mediation. It's our hope and expectation that we will continue to work together to further mediation as a credible dispute settlement mechanism. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, so the Singapore Convention provides a uniform international framework to enforce mediated agreements. Now its aim is to give businesses more confidence in opting for mediation, a process near and dear to all of us, to resolve their disputes. And obviously, ultimately, the goal is to facilitate international trade. Now to make the most of the opportunities which the Convention presents to parties and practitioners, uh, it's very important uh, that we understand the impetus, the origins and the framing. And for that purpose, we welcome today someone who's been intimately involved with this entire process, our learned friend, Ms. Judith Nieper. Just allow me to say that Judith is a legal working officer in the International Trade Division of the Office of Legal Affairs of the UN, which is the Secretariat of the UNCTRAL. And she's currently responsible for the UNCTRAL mediation framework, Ms. Judith. Uh, thank you very much. Let me try if I manage to share my screen. Do you see it? We see you. You see me, but do you also see the slides? <laughs> Not yet. While you're doing that, I did want to make one announcement as I close this window. Because um, One quick announcement is the translation is available in Arabic on the SCCA website. So those interested in availing themselves of an Arabic translation of all the proceedings, you can see it now and hear it now and or uh, allow me james uh, until uh, the slides uh, will will work i would like also to share good news that today here yes, uh, yes the scca the saudi center for commercial arbitration we launch our new branch in king salman energy city in the eastern province of saudi arabia so we are today celebrating two things celebrating the you know the the launch of our new branch in the eastern province in the uh, king salman uh, king salman uh, Econ uh, energy City and at the same time celebrating the partnership with UNICEFAL. So uh, by these words, and if you allow me, just I would like to keep our experts uh, with you for the discussion. And uh, thank you. And would like to congratulate everyone here about these two good news. Thank you very much. 
thank you for qualifying me as an expert. Obviously, I'm not an expert in screen sharing, but do you see it now? Do you see? Okay, perfect. Very good. So what, when we discussed uh, the way forward of these webinars, we were from the very beginning very clear that we need to present the drafting process and to really explain what UNCITRAL is. And this because the drafting process of UNCITRAL is indeed unique and, and this is more important, um, it's essential to understand the texts that come out of that drafting process. And this is why I would like, uh, now I cannot move the slides, it's always something, ah, now. And this is why I would like to go and to take you on what UNCITRAL means. So UNCITRAL has been created more than 50 years ago in uh, 1966. Um, and it's an intergovernmental body with limited membership. We come to that later. Tasked with the modernization and harmonization of um, international trade law. So we do have 60 member states. They are elected for, uh, for terms of six years. And in order to make sure that all the different geographical regions, that all the different um, economic, all the different legal systems are well represented, we do have uh, regional groups. And from these regional groups, we always have 14 states from Africa, 14 from the Asia Pacific region. You see it on the slide. 10 from Latin America, eight from Eastern Europe, and 14 from Western Europe and other. This is to make sure that we really get input from all over the world. Since the 70s, um, a number of states were interested to know what is going on in these UNCITRAL sessions. And that's why the uh, commission decided to invite every United Nations member state. So that means that we are sending out for each working group session, for each commission session, 193 invitations. And it's up to each state to decide whether they would like to join um, or, or not to join. We further do invite international organizations and we do invite uh, NGOs. The idea is to get the best possible input and to be able to draft universal texts that really benefit from universal knowledge. So this is the goal and this is why it's so important to get really input from, from all of you to, to allow us to make the, te the text uh, better and to make them suitable for all very different legal systems and for all very different circumstances and, um, and situations. So the way we are organized, we have the commission. The commission is the body that uh, gives the directions, that decides on the topics we should uh, work on, that is uh, overseeing how the working groups are working. Then we are having six working groups dealing with very different uh, areas. Working group two was charged to design, to draft uh, the mediation rules. Currently mediation, uh, uh, working group two is still dealing with dispute um, resolution, but uh, focusing on expedited proceedings in, in arbitration. We have a second working group that is dealing with dispute resolution in the larger sense, which has an impact also on mediation, and that is working group three which is um, uh, focusing its work on ISDS reform. And there, and there you see how important mediation is, mediation is also on the table and is also discussed. And then you have the secretariat where I'm from, and we are tasked to uh, serve both the working group and the, and the commission, and we are also in charge of promoting our, our text. So coming to the uh, topic of today, which is uh, the mediation texts, UNCITRAL has been working in that area since 1980, so since quite uh, a long time. Um, it has been tabled uh, 
already at, at the establishment of UNCITRAL, it has always been there when we discussed arbitration issues. But in 1980, we drafted the first text, which are contractual rules, the conciliation rules, contractual rules for private parties. Um, some 20 years later, it was seen that we need further, we, we need legislative uh, provisions because some issues could not could possibly not be dealt with on a contractual basis, um, for instance, the issue of confidentiality and other issues. That's why we had the UNCITRAL model law on international commercial conciliation. You see there that I'm still using for these two texts the term conciliation. In the UNCITRAL context, the terms conciliation, mediation are used interchangeably. And when we started, working in the area um, in 1980, the term conciliation was the more popular term. Now, with the new, newly adopted text, the Singapore Convention and the new model updated model law, we changed terminology. So now we use the term mediation as the, as the lead um, term. So we have in, in 2002, when the, the model law was adopted, there was possibly no agreement among the, the states to develop uh, rules in the area of enforcement. So you have in this model law from 2002, you have an article 14 saying we could not agree on enforcement. So this is to be done by every state. A mediation settlement agreement is binding, but the enforcement um, is in the hands, is in the national hands of, of each state. And now, again, 20 years later, there has been huge development. We have two new texts that close this gap um, and make settlement agreements resulting from mediation enforceable. We have the Singapore Convention that has been drafted, taking as a model the New York Convention. Um, and we updated the, the model on international commercial conciliation to, to really be able to offer a complete, complete UNCITRAL uh, framework in the area of, of mediation. There are still two texts that are on the, on the agenda of the commission, and this is an update of the conciliation rules. As already said, they are from 1980, so they need to be updated after uh, 20 years, 40 years, sorry. Um, and we have another text, which are the notes that's more like a checklist and explanation of what the mediation process consists of. This is also at the, on the agenda of the commission and will, because of the COVID-19 situation, we didn't have a proper commission session this year. So it will probably then be decided upon um, next year during the commission session 2021. 20, and that's the point in time where we should, from the UNCITRAL perspective, have a complete and updated uh, mediation framework that I hope you find um, useful. Here, this is just uh, so that you see, this is the working group two. Everyone looks a little bit tired because this, is, this was the moment when the model law was and the Singapore Convention was agreed upon. So everyone is tired, but relieved. You can see the, the happy but tired smiles. This is a photo of the very successful signing ceremony. We have 46 and among them, um, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia signed up uh, to the Singapore Convention. And here I have to correct Anna Juban Brett, uh, who our secretary, who said in her opening remarks, which she recorded before her holiday, that we have 52 signatories. Since then, since uh, she started her holiday, we have a 53rd um, signatory. So uh, we have constant um, development in that area and recording greetings is not safe in that area, luckily, I must say. And here you see the delegation, your delegation is, 
from Saudi Arabia, so you might recognize um, uh, all of them. This last slide is to show you, this, this is a screenshot from our website, which shows you how to find the, the travaux preparatoire from, from the convention. So if you go on the website and you go on text and status, this is where you find all of our adopted texts. There you click on the, on the Singapore Convention on Travaux Preparatoire and you find the whole discussion. And this is really needed in order to understand the texts. You cannot understand the text by looking at it with your national glasses, with your national knowledge. You have to forget everything you learned about law and go into the international setting. This is an international text drafted by nearly 100 states. So you have all of these very different approaches that are reflected in the text, which is of course a compromise. So in order to properly understand that, we, we set up the, um, all the discussions are there, both in writing and uh, in, in audio recording. And what we are also doing once we have cases that are dealing with the uh, mediation convention, all of these cases will be published on, the, um, on our website in our case law database, which should help us in reaching uniform interpretation of all of these um, articles that we are, we are having in the Singapore Convention. And with that, I give it back to James. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Judith. Um, and I've set down my national and I'm wearing my international glasses. So we're already off on the right foot. Alhamdulillah. So, um, so thanks again, Judith. Now we're going to turn to the practicalities of the Singapore Convention. So which practitioners need to grasp any inherent challenges that we face and how they might better navigate this emerging context the Singapore Convention is going to bring about. And for this, we welcome our friend from Malta our learned brother, Mr. Mark Appel. Mark's been an international mediator now for 40 years, and he's with RBDB Chambers in London, and he's mediated disputes and training mediators around the world. Mark is honorary board member of the IMI, as many of you know, and the immediate past chair of the IMI Investor State Mediation Task Force, Mr. Mark. Thank you, James, uh, uh, and uh, what, a, what a pleasure to be uh, working with UNCITRAL and with SCCA and such uh, distinguished colleagues. Um, uh, so now for a, a bit of summary uh, and some exploration. Um, uh, so uh, the Singapore Convention um, uh, scope is, and, and keywords, international uh, commercial disputes uh, settled with the assistance of a mediator. Okay, so we'll take them. Uh, international, uh, easy definition, different states, uh, but also, um, uh, can mean uh, the place of bi business is different uh, uh, than uh, uh, the locale or the place of performance uh, or the place where the subject matter of the dispute uh, is, is, is different as well. So there's uh, multiple opportunities to use that word international or interpret it. A uh, commercial is a big word. Uh, and my hope is that judiciaries uh, will err on the side of, of uh, interpreting it broadly. Uh, in the place where I studied law, uh, commerce was impacted by a farmer growing wheat uh, in her own field for her own consumption. So big term, uh, uh, co uh, commerce and commercial. Um, there are uh, specific exclusions uh, in the convention and, and one of them is consumer. So a, uh, a consumer, whether it's for family, uh, personal or household purposes, uh, the areas of employment law, uh, family law uh, and inheritance law are specifically excluded from application uh, of the uh, uh, convention. Um, now, having said that, I think it's, it, it might be worth mentioning, particularly in the context of the Middle East, where family owned business is such a prevalent uh, a style of doing business uh, that uh, my, my hope and my, my uh, frankly, my understanding, I hope it will work this way and I'm fairly sure it will work this way, uh, that the substantial percentages of family business uh, conducted in the Middle East will be covered by uh, the convention. It's not family law, it's family business. 
Okay, let's talk about other exclusions. Um, settlement agreements that are already before a court uh, or uh, will be uh, concluded by a court and enforceable as a judgment uh, uh, you know, appropriately are not covered by the convention. There's already a place to go They're before the court. Uh, similarly, uh, arbitral awards by agreement or, or what we refer to in the, uh, uh, in the uh, disputes industry as uh, consent awards uh, are not covered by the convention. Again, they don't need to be. Uh, you have the New York Convention uh, available for that purpose. Uh, uh, so uh, those, those matters are excluded. Now, let's turn to mediation. Um, the, uh, uh, here I think Judith's uh, explanation of how the law uh, or how the convent and how the convention was arrived at is useful uh, because mediation means different things in different places uh, to different cultures. There are many approaches uh, to mediation. And so the definition of mediation uh, in the convention is appropriately broad. So I'll, I'll give you some words. So ir irrespective of the expression used, so it might be called conciliation, for instance, uh, or the basis carried out. Uh, so the assistant, uh, 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 or the basis carried out. So whether it was uh, a, a transformative uh, style, whether it was an evaluative style, uh, you know, whether the the, the mediator was facilitative uh, in their style. These are all going to be covered by uh, the convention. Um, it's broad. Um, so uh, mediation speaks to all of them. What's required is that the mediator not have the authority to impose a decision on the parties, and that's critical. And it's uh, 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 an, an appropriate question to ask uh, uh, under the circumstances is, you know, what happens to a mediation where the mediation settlement occurs as part of a need arb process, so a hybrid a mediation process, uh, or perhaps what happens in the context of a mediation within a traditional uh, a justice system, so an elder uh, acting as mediator. Um, and I think in those circumstances, I think you have to go to the root of the authority of the person who is acting as mediator, um, and the parties can certainly help the process. So here's a practice tip. I would have something in my settlement agreement uh, that would speak to my expectation that the Singapore Convention would apply. Okay, just a tip. Um, let's turn to the agreement itself. The agreement, the requirement is that the agreement be in writing. Uh, and unsurprisingly, uh, e-agreements uh, are, are covered. What's, what's critical there is that the settlement agreement be recoverable, that it can be found, you know, that it exists somewhere. Um, and there must be evidence that it resulted from mediation. There are some, uh, several things suggested and then a very broad uh, uh, sort of discussion. So uh, attestation by a mediator, not so common, uh, but we may see more of that given the convention. Uh, attestation by an administering institution. Now that would be common. Uh, and I think it's gonna make institutional mediation that much more attractive. Uh, other evidence, well, other evidence might be correspondence. It might be a notarial approval. I, I'm thinking there, I just have to think broadly, how else would you show that the matter was um, resolved by mediation? In terms of the procedure uh, for, for enforcement, uh, each state, now the, the, the convention speaks to parties, both parties to the mediation and parties to the convention. So each party to the convention, meaning state, Will, will enforce in accordance with its own rules for procedure and, and put a big underscore under and, uh, under conditions required by the convention. Um, there is language that says, and here's a hint uh, to, uh, to the states, uh, uh, competent authority shall act expeditiously. So hopefully any procedure will be an efficient procedure. Um, the, the convention was drafted to serve as both a, what we would say in the, in the sort of disputes business, a sword and a shield. So it can be used both to, to prove the, the settlement of a matter 
when someone brings a, uh, an action against you or to enforce a matter uh, where uh, you want to enforce an agreement reached uh, in mediation. Of course, there are grounds for refusing the relief provided for by the convention. So um, not, not surprisingly, incapacity of a party, mental state, age, uh, for instance. Uh, uh, the settlement agreement, for whatever reason, is void, uh, uh, inoperative, incapable of performance, uh, or not binding, not final according to its terms, um, here again, I would think about a drafting concern. I would think about putting a line into my settlement agreement saying this is the final, this is meant to incorporate all like a zipper clause in a, in a commercial contract. This is final and, and incorporates all of the party's agreements. Um, uh, another ground for abusing, uh, refusing relief is that the obligations have already been performed or they're not clear uh, or comprehensible. Um, there is one that says uh, not a grant of relief would be contrary to the terms of settlement. That's interesting. Uh, uh, I'm searching for that one, but I guess there would be circumstances where that might be the case. Um, there is also a provision that will concern mediators. So a serious breach of standards by a mediator um, uh, or a mediation without which a party would not have entered into settlement. Okay, so um, understand that, that, those, that last part of the sentence, without which the party would not have entered into settlement, is a big if. It places the burden of proof, if you will, on the party who is seeking to avoid uh, enforcement. It is a high standard. Uh, so mediators, of course, you'll act within your uh, ethical constraints uh, and the constraints provided by the party's contract, but you know, there's grounds for setting aside. Um, further grounds, failure of the mediator to disclose uh, uh, circumstances which might raise justifiable doubts regarding the mediator's impartiality or independence. But again, the catch and failure to disclose had material impact or undue influence without which the party wouldn't have signed the agreement. So it, there's a, it's a big burden of proof on the party seeking to set aside, not only must there be, must there be this uh, uh, breach of the mediator's duty to disclose, but it must have impacted uh, the party's willingness or ability, rather ability to settle. So not negotiator's remorse, okay? Not enough to not like your deal the day after. Um, Finally, uh, a, a, an agreement can be set aside if, it is, if the grant of relief would be contrary uh, to the public policy of the state or the subject matter is not capable of resolution uh, by a mediation. And hopefully I'll come back to that, the questions. Um, the reservations under the convention uh, are very limited. There are two. Uh, one allows states to opt out and governmental entities to opt out, uh, common to convention. So the government is not, and governmental entities not covered. Uh, second, and again, that's an opt out. Second is an opt out which says, the convention shall apply, but it will only apply where parties to the settlement agreement agree that the settlement will apply. So there's a double, you know, first you have to, the convention applies, and then at the time of settlement, the parties say, okay, the settlement, the uh, convention will apply. All right, I think that's all my time. I wanna thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. You're on mute, James. Sorry, thank you, Mark. Uh, <laughs> Judith gave us some of the context, Mark some of the key current challenges, and now we're gonna focus on the future itself. And who better to share her analysis of the Singapore Convention than a Singapore-based practitioner who's literally written the book on the subject, the Mediation Convention on Mediation, Nadia Alexander. She's putting up her slides now. I'll just give you a brief overview. Nadia is an international mediation specialist and an award-winning author and trainer. And as we know, she's spearheaded domestic and cross-border mediation reform, particularly in Asia and the Pacific. <clears throat> Currently, Nadia is serving as the director of the Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy 
and she's also on the board of the UN Global Mediation Panel. So I turn this over to Ms. Nadia. Thank you, James. Can I check that you can hear me and see the slides? Okay, great. So um, today I, I, I want to ask the question, what happens after the ink has dried, after the ink has dried on the Singapore Convention? Um, we know here we are uh, in August 2020. Convention's been signed by 53 countries. We've heard... Let's, oh, now I'm trying to just move my slide. Hang on. There we go. Uh, and you can see, um, uh, this is a slide from the International uh, Mediation Institute's website, quite a big geographical range. I'm ratified by more than three, will come into force on the 12th of September. And so my question is, well, so what, right? Um, what does this mean and what is this going to change, right? Um, here is a list of the countries and you'll notice, apart from Saudi Arabia, um, major um, uh, economies and jurisdictions such as China, US and India. But why bother or why have we bothered and what difference will it make? And so to talk about that and what impact this might have on implementation and what we can expect, um, let me just ask this question. So in one sense, yes, why did we bother? with the Singapore Convention, why did UNCTRL bother? On one sense, yes, it's about enforceability, about having an expedited enforceability mechanism um, for uh, situations where there might, for example, be non-compliance of an international, of a settlement agreement. Um, at SIDRA, we in Singapore, we did a survey um, that's just, and we've just got the final report out now, um, where we looked at cross-border mediation, uh, arbitration and litigation from the perspective of users, and that's legal users and client users. So the corporate decision makers and also their lawyers. And yeah, no surprise, the three top factors in choosing a dispute resolution mechanism for cross-border matters, enforceability, impartiality and cost. But when you break it down, and this is interesting, for legal users, the top one was enforceability. For client users, impartiality. It doesn't mean enforceability is not important, but the question is, What's, what's on their mind? So what about the users who use, who currently use? And I mean, this, was, this survey was conducted prior to the Singapore Convention, and even now it's not yet in force, right? So pre-convention, the people who use international, uh, med, uh, international commercial mediation, why do they do it? What are the relevant factors, right? Neutrality, impartiality of the third party and the forum, speed, confidentiality, and right up there also, if you look at the percentages, they're fairly, they're fairly uh, similar and high. Flexibility of the process and cost. Fairly well down the bottom, we've got enforceability and finality. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that the, that, that the absence of infor expedited enforce enforceability mechanism is not important. But what it does mean is that people who are currently using cross-border mediation have made a choice to use mediation because they think there is a low risk of non-compliance with any outcome of the mediation. And that's certainly what came through in our survey. So if there's high compliance with mediation, why do you need a convention to offer this expedited enforceability? Well, what came through was that there's a whole bunch of users who are currently either using typically arbitration or increasingly hybrid processes right, who would otherwise be be tempted to use mediation um, if that existed. And it's in many senses, it's about having confidence, particularly for lawyers, the confidence to engage in mediation, knowing that even if it's a low risk, right, there's a risk of non-compliance, where do we go to, right? Enter the Singapore Convention. So to my mind, yes, in a narrow sense, it's about enforceability, but in a bigger sense, it's about establishing the credibility, the visibility, uh, and the legitimacy of international commercial mediation, international mediation as a standalone process. Right? Users who were engaged in med-arb or arb-med-arb hybrid processes said, well, we didn't use mediation, why? Because risk of non-compliance, our lawyer said, no expedited enforceability mechanism. Um, why didn't we use arbitration? Oh, well, we were really concerned about preserving the business relationship. So there's an absolute space for mediation. So having said that, you think, well, come 13th of September, the day after the convention comes into force, 
Will the dispute resolution world change overnight? Well, if the trends in domestic jurisdictions are anything to go by, no, right? because we've had expedited enforceability mechanisms in many jurisdictions, where they're particularly common law jurisdictions, where there's been decades and decades of, of commercial practice, and there hasn't been that immediate shift. And you have to ask yourself, why? Well, apart from, oh, just before I get there, I just wanted to share one more piece, and this is our relevant, I think, uh, Mark might, may or may not have mentioned investor state, but I think he will later if he didn't already. Um, when, we, um, when we asked our, our um, uh, people who were involved in investor state dispute resolution, what do you think right, is, going to, uh, is, is, is going to be a useful in, in, in reform, in the reform of, um, I think I've got the wrong slide up here. Here we go. What's going to be useful in reforming the dispute resolution process you'll see ability to use mediation with 52%, right? So it's, it's highly attractive. It has a high satisfaction level, um, but, um, but what will make it, uh, people use it as much as they're currently using arbitration, even though the satisfaction rate for arbitration in terms of cost and speed is much lower than in relation to mediation, all right? So step back again. Where are we going with this, right? Well, it's not just the Singapore Convention in isolation, right? It's part of a much bigger cross-border dispute resolution scene, right? Uh, there's the New York Convention, yes. And there's also, I think you, hopefully you can see this, the, um, uh, the Hague Convention on, uh, on Foreign Court Judgments of 2019, which is also in its very early stages. So basically, the Singapore Convention is part of a bigger um, uh, a bigger ecosystem, if you like. And if, if for cross-border disputes, the 20th century was the century of arbitration, I'm tempted to say this century is going to be the century of cross-border mediation, but actually it's probably going to be the century of appropriate dispute resolution, right? Knowing and understanding, having a real choice about which type of mechanism is going to be suitable for the disputants in the context of this particular dispute. So yes, we need to get a critical mass of jurisdictions signed on to the Singapore Convention. And having this convention, it's a critical key really to unlock the portal to this 21st century of dispute resolution, of appropriate dispute resolution and mediation. But mediation itself, right, does not sit in a vacuum, right? There is a regulatory and, and uh, an institutional ecosystem, which is fundamental, right? And if any jurisdiction, or any institution, any mediator, any lawyer, any client wants to be able to get the most out of the Singapore Convention, they need to be aware of um, uh, the, the type of regulatory and institutional capacity that is needed to do so. And what I have here um, are 10 points. I'm not going to um, talk about all of them. Um, I'll just highlight a few. But 10 um, aspects or, or factors which I think are absolutely essential for a, a, an, a mediation ecosystem in any jurisdiction so that this convention can work uh, for the benefit of all stakeholders. So I'll go through them all, but I'll, as I said, I'll just highlight a couple. So Having a comprehensive and congruent or harmonized law of cross-border mediation. With harmonized, I mean many jurisdictions have a, already have domestic uh, laws or laws for domestic um, uh, mediation and are now introducing laws and may also may have the Singapore Convention, for example, laws on cross-border mediation. Um, it's helpful, right, particularly for foreigners coming into any jurisdiction to mediate that those laws be harmonized and also that they deal with more than just enforceability, right? So um, think about how are mediation laws, how are mediations triggered? What gets people to the mediation table? You know, enforceability of mediation clauses, um, practice directions um, or advice by your lawyer. Um, how is the actual procedure regulated? And very often that's by soft law, institutional codes and rules. So there's a massive role for institutions here. Um, and what about credentialing and standards, right? We've heard, and I know there are many mediators on, in, in this call as well, 
Um, how are they, how is their role regulated? And of course, as Mark outlined um, in Article 5, I think it's E and F, there are two grounds of refusal that are linked to mediated conduct and to applicable standards. So I think this will become um, an increasingly um, important um, part of mediation law in the broad sense of the word. And then of course, there's all the laws that deal with the rights and obligations of people who are in the mediation. What are the rights and obligations of the mediator, of the lawyers, of the parties, of anyone else who comes into the mediation? Yes, there's enforceability, there's also confidentiality, there's also issues of admissibility of mediation evidence if a matter gets to court, and numerous other um, issues, duties, rights as well. So an ecosystem needs to have um, uh, thought about those issues. Mediation infrastructure, including not just physical, but technological infrastructure and services. Access to internationally recognized skilled local and foreign mediators. I think this is an important point, particularly for jurisdictions which had developed a very strong domestic scene that, that I see quite often that the um, accreditation or credentialing systems are often set up for locals, right? And it's a, sometimes harder for foreign mediators to be recognized. That's not always the case, but sometimes the case. And certainly in cross-border commercial mediation, um, users want to have the flexibility um, to choose their mediator regardless of nationality. Um, enforceability is what we're here for with the, uh, with the Singapore Convention. I won't go into that. And confidentiality, a very important part of that. What's the impact of the commencement of mediation on litigation limitation periods? In most common law countries, people say, so what? This is not important. In many civil law jurisdictions, it's a big issue and it's regulated. Point seven, I just want to say a few words about. What's the court's attitude to and the court's relationship with mediation? And I think this is absolutely crucial to the future of cross-border mediation and how the Singapore Convention is going to be accepted and used and implemented, how it's going to come to life. Um, um, what we've seen, I mean, because courts will make decisions about, well, here's a, here's a bit of paper, or here's a series of emails. Uh, is, this a, is this a settlement agreement? Is it in writing? Uh, is it uh, the result of a mediation? Uh, how do we know? Is it international? Um, so making sure that the judiciary are familiar with mediation, understand what it is and how it's different from arbitration and, uh, and, and litigation, and understand that this new thing, which I'm going to call an international mediated settlement agreement, that, that it has a, a different, a new status in international law, right, and how to recognize that. Um, uh, experience shows that, that uh, courts which have uh, court-connected mediation systems, um, of, often in those situations, judges become quite familiar with mediation um, and uh, you end up with a um, quite a pro-mediation judiciary, which doesn't mean that anything goes, but judges have a sophisticated understanding of it. Um, incentives for legal advisors, who are the gatekeepers to engage in mediation. Um, and knowing that mediation itself sits together within the broader ecosystem of arbitration and mediation and having refer referrals, 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 processes or procedures and institutions so that parties um, can move from litigation to mediation to arbitration or back to mediation in a seamless way. I mean, what we're after is how do you make your jurisdiction mediation friendly with the help of the convention? And number 10, which you probably can't see, is about ongoing monitoring and review. Um, so just to close, I wanted to recognise um, also, my collaborators, and um, these are two sources that I drew on uh, a lot for this presentation. Um, a book on the Singapore Convention that I wrote with my colleague Shoyu Chong, I wanted to recognize him, and the Singapore, uh, the SIDRA survey, um, the report I put together with uh, my colleagues uh, Bajo um, Yogadze, I have to learn to pronounce his name better, he's my colleague, from Georgia, and, uh, and Alison Go. So I wanted to say thank you to them, uh, and I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, I know that Mark is going to be uh, exhibiting the, one of the key attributes of a mediator, of being highly responsive to clients, and he has to head off to a meeting. Uh, but Mark, just in one sentence, do you advise states to opt in or opt out? You've done a lot of work on investor state settlements disputes. Yeah, uh, uh, very fast, because I, I am going to run, and I apologize for that. Uh, opt in, 
So say yes. Uh, my strong feeling is that states should lead uh, on public policy initiatives. And one way to do it is to sign on as the state and, and, and with uh, public bodies engaged. Um, also, I think it will make the state more attractive as a, a location for investment. I believe that there are tools now for states to create supportive uh, processes to both enable the state to act uh, quickly and effectively on behalf of its uh, own interests. So I would look at the Energy Charter uh, Organization's uh, model instrument uh, for dispute management. Um, so for all those reasons, um, I, I would strongly urge states to sign on, uh, do so in a thinking way, have good policy, uh, uh, have a public policy in support of the process and lead the charge. Here, here. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mark. Sorry to go. Excellent. Good luck with your matters. Now moving on to Judith. Um, I guess the question I'd start with you is, you alluded to this in your presentation, but how have diverse legal traditions been accommodated in the drafting of these instruments? Specifically, um, we've heard talk about the One Belt, One Road. We've heard a lot of different agencies, bodies, jurisdictions tout that the convention is somehow going to help them to transcend or bridge or otherwise address their regional or local differences. How would, you, how would you say that this has been addressed in the drafting and the overall process initially? Yes, thank you. Um, and this is why we are especially suffering from COVID, if I may say so, because the essence of our drafting process is really that everyone comes together, that it's in one inclusive process where we, we try to have everyone in one room, the whole knowledge to make sure that we can make the best text. And this is also why we discuss, um, for instance, in the six languages. So we do have everything that is also, uh, on our website also translated into Arabic. You have everything there and everyone can raise his or her concern um, and explain the, the background. And this is why we spend a lot of time on definitions of legal terms because we use them differently in the in the international context than in the in the national context. Thank you, Judith. A quick question for, for Nadia I received by email. Um, obviously there's been a lot more arbitration case law um, and jurisprudence over the years. Um, I guess the question is to what extent do you think <laughs> can presage or give us a sense of where things are going and how can jurisprudence generally, you know, fill in the implementation gaps? So I think um, uh, many people who may, may not have worked in jurisdictions um, where there has been a long history of what I'll call contemporary mediation may not be aware that there is a substantial body of mediation case law in many common law jurisdictions. So I think you know, where it is directly relevant, right? Because parts of the Singapore Convention are drawn from the New York Convention. So where it is direct, directly um, relevant uh, and, 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 uh, and, the, yeah, and doesn't go to the difference of, of the two proceedings, yes, arbitration uh, law may be useful. But I think what's very important is, is, uh, is for uh, stakeholders, uh, also, also, you know, judges from jurisdiction where, jurisdictions where this may be new to, uh, just to have a look at the um, at, at the substantial body of case law that does exist, because this is not new in two ways. Um, I think in an earlier conversation, James, you said we've been there before, right? So we've been there before with arbitration, and we can learn from there. But we've also, many, many jurisdictions have been there before with mediation, uh, even cross-border mediation, but primarily it, domestic mediation out of a domestic setting. And there's a lot to be gained um, from, from there. On a recent webinar, thank you, Nadia, um, Judith and I were discussing this, and um, I think the consensus among us was that um, we expect to see very uh, similar patterns, and, and also that, that people will, uh, don't ever, I mean, you've all mentioned the general acceptance and compliance and implementation of mediated settlement agreements. So litigation is not the norm, 
But I think that with complex cross-border disputes, we may see a little more. And I think that one of the keys is what was alluded to in the presentations, is engaging with the bar, engaging with the judiciary, engaging with policymakers and decision people around the world to ensure that they are well aware of their role and what they ought to do, what they can't do, and how they can play a very constructive role. And that's where we were very happy to have uh, the deputy minister with us today, because these are the people we need to engage. A, a final question for, for um, Judith. And specifically, um, we got a request here about, do we get the slides in the recording? I can affirm that this presentation will be uploaded online and so people can review it, share it, clip it, and use various aspects of it as they see fit. Um, but obviously, since you're with Bunsetral and you're aware of a number of the resources available, I guess perhaps uh, Judith could give us an indicator of where best to access a lot of the ongoing discussion that Travolta Preparatoire she already alluded to, but beyond that, where's the best place for the practitioners on this call and council and parties to avail themselves of that information? And Judith is muted, which is usually a very good thing. No. <laughs> um, we, we do have all the information on those texts that have been adopted on, under the rubric um, uh, text and status. For all the ongoing discussions, you have to look at the working groups. And there you have two working groups that are of relevance for in the area of dispute resolution. There's working group two, which is dealing with expedited proceedings, and there's working group three on ISDS. If you click on the ISDS uh, working group, working group three, you see that we also uploaded a webinar on um, uh, ISDS mediation in ISDS. So you could access it there and you have also all the articles, all the slide, all the um, everything that is relevant to the Singapore Convention and to the ongoing discussions. Lovely. Um, a quick question, um, because we're going to wrap this up in about five minutes. We'll go over to allow people. We still have a uh, solid audience. But this one, of course, would be for Professor Nadia. Um, do you think the convention is going to have an impact on the practice of mediators themselves? And specifically in light of Article 5, this ground for refusal linked to mediator misconduct, do you have anything to share for the practical uh, application amongst our practitioner friends? Um, so if you uh, look at the wording of, of Article 5 ENF, which refers to what I'm going to call in shorthand, you know, potential mediator misconduct, and, and Mark went through that, it's a very high bar. You have to be, a, you know, you have to behave pretty badly as a mediator, you know, to be able to show all those things. So, um, you know, so I think, um, I think at the end of the day, you're not going to find, um, you know, many mediators uh, or, or parties using those particular provisions on the basis of mediating misconduct. But I also think um, that as we're getting used to the convention and we're trying it out, people will try it on. People will try, will, will, you know, a disgruntled party um, will sort of think, well, how can I get out of this? Let me sue my lawyer. Oh, no, maybe I can say the mediator did something, right? So I think um, certainly mediators, um, a number of mediators I know working in this space are waiting um, for uh, cases which will try out and test, I guess, the boundaries of this provision. Um, but I would expect that it wouldn't change the how mediators practice, but it may change their paperwork a little bit. I think it's going to be very interesting moving forward. Just quickly, some of the questions, some more of the questions off the uh, chat. Uh, Adam Abdelaziz asks, we need to focus on the creation of a perfect career to build the personal mediation skills. Is there a specific basis and steps? I would suggest that this is a very good question and I will ask our colleagues at SCCA if we can maybe do some sort of a mediation seminar webinar to help with practice development to help people develop their own careers and how to leverage their various relationships and resources and so forth because there are some specific skills that people need for developing not just their skills as practitioners and mediators but also developing their actual skills as rainmakers as practice development relationship managers and so on and they need to think about a lot of the questions related to quality control, feedback from the parties post session and everything else. There's a whole lot there 
and we'll definitely do that. Another question is from Afnan, and he asks, how can COVID-19 pandemic affect mediation? I'll take that question very briefly before we wrap up. Um, we did do a session which should be available online, and there are several available online that speak specifically to this. One of the most, uh, one of the biggest changes, obviously, is the shift of the virtual environment. Um, one of the programs offered is it, that Dr. Hamid, uh, the CEO of SCCA, alluded to at the outset, is the emergency mediation program, the one that was launched a few months ago and, and has attracted considerable attention and, in fact, uh, garnered the nomination for the GAR Prize. What's interesting about this is that the COVID itself has meant that all of us are doing our mediations virtually, um, almost overwhelmingly. Uh, the uptake's been very good in different jurisdictions. Just yesterday, I was speaking to our colleagues in Sri Lanka, and they continue to do a lot of uh, ADR online. This is happening all around the world. If you, if you access the websites of all the major providers, whether it's the ICC, the AAA's International Division, LCIA, SEAC, all of them have various guidelines, protocols, instructions. Some of them, like the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, also have different thought pieces and recommendations. A lot of them have templates and, and issues that you need to flag and be aware of. But the biggest difference for COVID, obviously, is the general isolation of the parties themselves, which has to be taken into account. They can't get face-to-face -face time, which is often very constructive and comforting for them with their counsel and other experts. So everything is remote. So if you factor this in, and again, um, you can leverage a lot of these technologies quite effectively, and you'll be surprised how consistent and positive has been the experience of parties. One thing that is universal, everyone has agreed that two hours, and usually about an hour and a half, is all people can handle in one shot in a virtual mediation context, um, because it's, it's quite exhausting as a new format. But I think that people are getting more adroit, mediators are getting more skilled, parties are getting more comfortable, um, and it is definitely the way forward. So basically, on behalf of everyone today, all of those who joined us and people who are going to download this subsequently, uh, this is the first in a series of three webinars. Um, and I will speak to the next one in just a moment. But thank you all for joining us. Thanks to our host, Dr. Hamid al Miral, our CEO of the SCCA, His Excellency Deputy Minister, Mr. Balor abdul Mohsen al-Hadab, and Her Excellency uh, Secretary Anna for her remarks. And finally, of course, our learned friends and presenters, uh, Judith Nieper, Mark Appel, and Nadia Alexander. It's our hope that all of us are going to be working to ensure that the Mediation Convention evolves and expands its reach across the globe. And if the impact of the New York Convention is anything to go by, I think we have a good future ahead of us for those of us who promote the use of mediation. Just very briefly, I wanted to tell you that the next session is on the CISG. This is also in cooperation and partnership, full partnership with UNSATRA, CISG and other uniform law tools for contractual risk mitigation. That's gonna be on August 27 at 3 p.m., 8 a.m. Uh, East Coast here in North America, 1 p.m. Europe and two for much of Europe. So again, thank you all for joining us. This has been a real pleasure to work again with all of our friends and thank all of you for joining us and those watching subsequently. Have a good afternoon, evening and morning, wherever you might be. Cheers.